It just seems like you're the busiest man in show business. So what's a typical day look like for you nowadays? Well, um, so this is time off from Foreigner for a while. I mean, I start March 1st back with them. But a typical day for me is I get up early. I do my morning meditation. I go out and get some coffee, check my emails and all that kind of stuff, and then generally come in here and start working. I like to be in here by 9 or 10, and I'll work all day if I can. Uh, it depends on what I'm doing. Right now, I'm working on a prog project that I did with Craig Goldie 30 years ago. And uh, we wrote a bunch of music, recorded a bunch, but on some of it, we didn't put real drums. So we're doing that now, and that's very fun and exciting. I had Red Beach here all last week, and we were writing the next Black Swan record. So I, I just love to be in here recording. And so with Foreigner, is this the final tour? Well, this is the farewell tour in that this is the last time we're going to go out in the you know the nine months of the year being on the road that long touring year long touring that we've been doing for 20 years now uh that's the end of that this year is the last year of that after that we'll be very selective about dates not really sure we haven't really finalized what we're going to do after this yet there is some foreigner music floating around that we'd love to finish that's kind of a goal for 2025 um but it's the end of those long tours no, no more of that is that mostly due to mix health Actually, a lot of it's coming from Kelly. He wants to slow down, and he's been recently married for the first time in his life. He got married at 59 years old wow. for the first time. <laughs> but he's got a life now, and he wants to have the life, and so do all of us. So um, so it's, it's kind of stemmed from Kelly, but it's all of us wanting to slow it down. And just nine months of the year on the road is very difficult. It's very challenging, and it's hard to have a life when you're doing that. So we want to have a life. So you have a new album with The End Machine coming out. And, um, of course, you're working with George, as as you seem to always be working with George in some way. But uh, I was wondering with the uh, the singer, where did you find him? It was a suggestion from Serafino Perugino, who is the uh, head of Frontiers Records. Serafino, um, he called uh, Garish to our attention. He said, you got to check this guy out. I think he'd be really great for the M machine. And so when we heard him, it was like, yeah, you're right. And then it turned out to be amazing. No, I mean, his voice, it's obvious he's an incredible singer on a whole other level. Um, but he's also a great writer, and he had a great attitude, and we really worked well together. So, wow, what a find. We're very fortunate, and uh, the whole record, we're just really proud of the whole record. So I hope you get a chance to hear the whole record. Yeah, when does it come out? It comes out March 8th. And it's called The Quantum Phase? Quantum Phase. Quantum okay. Phase, yeah. yeah. Are these just all passion projects from the Revolution Saints to Black Swan to the End Machine? Is it really just like, hey, let's just keep busy and you're just doing it for the love? Because I'm assuming financially, even to release the album, there's really nothing to split up, right? You're, you're, you're right about that. Uh, it is all about passion. I mean, we do get paid to do this, but, you know, we couldn't make a living from it. So, um, yeah, we do it for out of passion. I mean, I, I mean, I just we I do have to make music and I got these great people that I get to make music with. Um, and because I love to do it, why not? I mean, it is it's in my DNA and it's it's not all about money for me. And so you also have Mick Brown's brother, right, in the end machine? Because yes, it looks yes, just like Brown. Mick at times. <laughs> no, yeah, he does. He looks. I mean, when we were doing the video, it was scaring us. I mean, George and I would look at each other like, wow, this is spooky. He looks just like Mick. Um, what a phenomenal player and singer. He sings a lot like Mick, too, because Mick Brown is a very, very, very underrated great singer. People, right. people should know that. He's really, really great. And Steve is, too. Um, and he's a wonderful guy, really great to work with. Um, if we can't have Mick Brown and we have Steve Brown, we are not taking a step backwards. It's really great. So we're lucky. Was he in bands as well, Steve? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I met Steve when he was like 16 years old, which is kind of cool. Um, but uh, anyway, um, yeah, he was in band. You know, he was in bands. He did a lot of studio work. He's He's been in bands that had deals and kind of that kind of thing. And he's been in Tesla now the last several years. And um, that's a pretty cool gig for him. So. Uh, but yeah, I've known Steve a long time and very proud of him. And because he did a lot of studio work, we were really able to get some great stuff out of him in the studio with, with M Machine. It's, uh, he's, he's just a really great player and it's really cool. I know the other guys both have, I think, stated that they don't talk to him or haven't heard from Mick. Have you? Yeah, actually, he even texted me on my birthday. For my birthday text, we spoke on the phone, I want to say maybe a month before that. I remember having a nice little chat with him. So we have contact. I mean, he wants to kind of 
he wants to get away from the whole music scene, but uh, we still get contact now and then. There's still some love. Well, very he, cool. He sent me a very sweet text on my birthday, I got to say. I saw you guys on the Tooth and Nail tour opening for Dio in Dallas. And right. um, I loved that show. It was a great combination. Does anything very. stand out from that tour? Well, yeah. Actually, I kind of consider that tour to be when Dokken formed into being a good live band because kind of before that, we weren't so great. We were still pretty loose as a live band. We weren't great yet. I mean, there was mom- we had ma- moments on the Break in the Chains tour, but once we started playing with Dio, George and I would watch them every night because they were so amazing. And, I mean, that was re- that was a great band, and they were at their peak at that point. Jimmy, Vivian, Vinny. I mean, it was incredible. And we watched, and we learned, and we got better. We got a lot better. And during that tour, I think we grew up and became men on stage as a live band. Really, we did. We came of age on that tour. And it was just an amazing tour because there's friendships that were cemented there that have lasted forever. I mean, you know, became close with Ronnie then and was close to Ronnie until he passed away. So, And Vinny is still one of my dearest friends. And um, Vivian is still close. I mean, I you know, the Last in Line records... Those guys are very, very, very close and dear friends. So I have a real soft spot in my heart for that tour. That was a great tour. Would you consider that probably one of the top tours? Yeah. Yeah, that and the Aerosmith tour that uh, Dokken did, that was a fabulous tour. That was at us at our peak. We were a damn good live band at that point. I've seen old videos, and I'm like, I'm impressed. You know, we were working hard, focused, a great live band. And then Don decided to break it up and leave. <laughs> but whatever. Um, but yeah, on the Aerosmith tour, that was that was a lot of fun. Plus, you know, for the first time, we had a band bus instead of band and crew together on a bus. And it was a great period for us. We were opening, but we were really on top. We were selling a lot of records. So everybody was in the building when we went on stage. And so the deal in the Aerosmith tours are, are the two tours that Doc and did that really stand out in my mind. And then with the breaking up, I've interviewed Don a couple of times and George, and Don told me over and over, no, it's, uh, I just went to the other guys and was like, hey, I'm about to have a fucking nervous breakdown and I can't work with George anymore, but I want the other guys and we just get another guitar player and we'll continue. And then George is, of course, like, no, Don wanted all the money and wanted to uh, do a deal or whatever, because you guys were kind of up, you had completed your contract and you were due a big payday. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, honestly, I don't remember Don doing much uh, talking to Mick and I about, st- I mean, yeah, I, I guess he may have kind of mentioned it or whatever, or kind of brought it up or whatever, but it was never really seriously talked about. He just wanted to leave is how I always understood it. I tried very hard to talk him out of it because I thought it was a really bad move. Um, yes, we were up for renegotiation. We could have made a shitload of money that we didn't get to make. And he went and signed a deal with Geffen. Uh, and I, I believe Geffen thought they were going to get Dokken as a band, and they ended up getting Don Dokken solo. So uh, that kind of went sideways for him a little bit. Um, but uh, no, I don't remember it ever being anything but Don wanting to leave. And uh, yes, I think he wanted to. I mean, his intention was to take the band and be the band Dokken and just move on and get other players. But because we had a partnership agreement, he couldn't do that. And, you know, he just somehow thought he could get through the legal stuff and it didn't work out for him. So, um, yeah, it was too it was too bad we broke up when we did. If we had we stayed together, uh, we could have done quite well. But Don always says, yeah, but maybe somebody would have OD'd or something, because I know I was doing a lot of drugs back then. And I didn't sober up until 89, so. And so how do you become the peacemaker amongst all the chaos? Is it just your personality? Or I know you and George seem to be like genuine friends. Are you friendly even back then with Don? Never really got as close to Don as I got to George. But there was a period where I got close to Don later, which is after we broke up and, and when we started getting back together. Don and I started working together again in 92. And we got very close then, 92 and 93, until I joined Dio. But in 92, we spent a lot of time together and got very, very close. Um, that was the closest I ever got to Don. So, yeah, we were friendly. There was, there, was, there was that. But there was always that business layer of tension that existed. So in the 80s, we couldn't – I never felt I could get that close to him. I think he had a wall up a little bit. I probably did, too. Um, 
But that's the funny thing, because George really kind of never had walls. George has always been George. Um, and I learned a lot about that. That that taught me a lot about being down to earth and honest is just the easiest way to deal with people. Um, and in the 80s, there was that tension that kind of made that difficult. Even when I talked to George, after I got off the phone, I just thought, what a sincere dude. Yeah, he just he seems... He's uh, a very real dude. Very He's not honest. not a lot of bullshit. But between them, is it just Don kind of had the walls up? And so that tension was there. I know well, there's also the thing where they... probably part of it. We had a lot of fault, too. I mean, I was doing a lot of drugs. There was drugs floating around that, that kind of made things a little challenging. Don was doing massive prescription drugs, which he never seems to include when he tells other people about right. doing drugs. <laughs> he doesn't mention his own drug use at the time, which was lots of prescription drugs. Um but um, which he's come clean on before, he said he went to rehab. So it's always kind of funny to me that he neglects to mention. I think he said to me, maybe Valium and booze. So a lot of booze. Yeah, and that, was, that was him. That was basically what he was doing in the 80s. And we were doing a lot of cocaine. But uh, so that that was bad. That was that, that all. All that stuff was bad. Uh, but then there's egos and it was money. It was the challenge of the money. And, you know, I think uh, for us, we were a band. And I think Don on some level wanted to just be the leader. I uh, wanted to be, have his own band where, you know, people, he had all the, all the say and being in a democracy, I think was a little challenging for him. Um, and he had sincere problems with George that I understood. Not everything he was feeling was, was, uh, was off the rack, well, off the rails. I mean, you know, there was, there was a lot of serious issues there. Um, but we just couldn't get past the communication and the egos, I think, were, were the real crux of it. Drugs hazed it up from both sides, but it was the egos and the um, lack of communication and lack of all being on the same page that I think tore us apart. Tooth and Nail and Under Lock and Key felt like focused records for us. When it got to Back for the Attack, by then, George and Mick and I had moved out to Phoenix, so we were away from Don, which made it hard. And Don came out a couple times to work, and we did accomplish some good work to, together out there. But, um, but you know, there was that distance. And then on the record, the record just got too, too carried away. I mean, it took way too long, cost way too much money. We weren't all focused together. And I do think Back to the Attack came out great, but it could have been even stronger. It really could have, um, had we been more focused. There's still some strong songs on there that hold up to this day. But like I say, the whole record could have been really phenomenal had we been a little more focused. Mm -hmm. 